happy Tuesday, Tuesday night at 6.30 Central Time, and we are back here for this series that I'm doing that's going to include a lot of information about language. And tonight is going to be all about Gestalt language processors. So I want to know who is here with me. I'm doing a live stream to both Facebook and YouTube at the same time right now. So I want to see how it goes. I want to see if I can get uh, comments from people from both. Um, so we're kind of testing the waters here. So let me know in the comments, are you watching on Facebook? Are you watching on YouTube? Uh, let me know. Let me know where you're watching from. So I live in Wisconsin. I'm on the border. I teach in Minnesota. And we have like this unseasonably warm stretch of weather that is only, only lasting for two more days. Um, if you're watching the replay at a later date, it is November 1st, and so usually we're well into winter weather, but we have like 70 degrees this week every day, and it's beautiful. So um, I see Shara here. Thank you for joining me. Um, let me know too, um, are you a parent? Are you a special education teacher? Are you a grandparent, uh, OT, speech language uh What's your background? Why are you here? And, oh, hi, Jill. So glad to see you. And Lindsay, awesome to see you. Okay. Well, we have a nice group of people here tonight. So I love any chatting and questions in the comments. Uh, it lets me know everyone's still awake. And uh, especially with this topic, if you have any questions, let me know. If you are watching the replay, feel free to ask questions too. And just put in hashtag replay and I'll try to get in there over the next couple days and answer questions you might have. Hi, Megan in Texas. Amanda. Oh, awesome. It's been 70 in Pennsylvania too. Fantastic. Amanda, paraprofessional. That's the one I didn't say. And that is who I depend on every single day. So thank you for being here. Lindsay's a parent of two. Okay. So let's get started. I value your time. Yesterday was Halloween. I hope your classroom went smoothly and well today. Mine was pretty good despite the day after Halloween and Halloween falling on a Monday. Anyway, um, we are going to talk about Gestalt language processors. So I do want you to tell me before I get going in the comments how comfortable are you on a scale of one to five if you had to explain gestalt language processing to a parent or another person uh, one a zero being I know nothing I would not know how to explain it and a five being like I'm an expert I can totally explain what that is so where are you on that zero to five scale for how comfortable you are with gestalt language processing and I love the honesty here. And I'll tell you guys, like this has been a learning curve for me too. We did not learn about this topic in college, even speech and language pathologists, right? So we didn't learn about this. We learn it over time and we get more comfortable. Even saying the word gestalt sometimes seems weird because it's the sh sound where there's an S. So I did look up the pronunciation just to be sure, but it's Gestalt. Um, but you might hear people say Gestalt too. It's fine. We know what everybody means, right? So, okay. So you guys are kind of like between a zero and a three, and that's great. Um, this is kind of like intro 101. In my Autism Little Learners membership, that's for parents and educators, we're going to dive deeper into this and um, look into ideas for how to build on language for Gestalt language processors. So let's get started. Now we have Gestalt language processors and we have analytic language processors. And I'm gonna tell you about the difference. So an analytic language processor is most typically developing children. They are analytical language processors and that means they learn language in more of a sequential, typical order. So when we think of kids that learn um, one word and then they learn to combine two words and then they speak in short sentences and then they speak in longer sentences and then they learn additional grammar skills along the way. 
So they go in these norms, uh, the normal so-called sequence for learning language. And we know that our autistic students that we have, whether you've worked with autistic children for years, many years, or a couple of years, we know our kids do not follow that same path. It's not linear, right? And often not predictable. So gestalt language processors are children who fall into the style of language development where they start speaking in chunks of language. And this can be so confusing, um, not only for parents, but for professionals too. Like, okay, but he can't tell me that he's hungry and say, uh, eat or uh, want cookie, but he can sing a whole song and he can say all the words in the song. He can recite the ABCs. Um, he can script different scenes from cartoons, right? Let me know in the comments, do you have students like that that maybe aren't functionally using verbal speech to let you know what they want, what they need, to have uh, some chit chat, but they can sing entire songs or they bring out like chunks of songs. Yes, Ashley says yes. Okay, so this is autism, right? It's a big part of autism. So often when you have a gestalt language processor, it usually starts with immediate echolalia. And we're going to go into that a little bit. Oh yeah, Jill says, I have a few students like this. Someone said for sure, yes. Okay, and I think what is hard is sometimes people will say about these kids like, well, I know they know how to say uh, such and such word. Let's come up with a, uh, they know how to say, I'll give an example later of hickory dickory dock. Now, if I show them a picture of a clock, they might not be able to understand what each word in the song hickory dickory dock means. Because you have mouse, you have run, up, the clock, right? And so they might not be able to break each sentence down and know what each word means, but they know what the chunk means. They know this is a song that I like and they might, uh, if they watch it on YouTube, they might have a vis vision in their head of what the cartoon or the uh, song looks like, right? So to them, that's a chunk. And so when we talk about echolalia, this is present when a child repeats what another person has said. And I'm assuming you guys are probably pretty comfortable with what echolalia is. Let me know in the comments. Like if someone asked you what's echolalia, you could probably give a simple answer like, oh, it's when a child repeats what I say, right? So this is a piece of Gestalt language processing. And so you know more than you think you do already when it comes to that term. So echolalia is when kids repeat what someone else said. And this is from ASHA, the American Speech Language and Hearing Associ Association. And they talk about two different types of echolalia. And I bet a lot of you are also familiar with both of these terms. So immediate echolalia refers to when they imitate you immediately. So today after school, I had an IEP meeting. It was actually an evaluation results meeting where we gave out the educational label of autism to this little boy. And he had throughout the testing process and then even when we were playing um, before we had the meeting, anything I would say, he would say. And some kids will just imitate uh, or echo one word so you might say, um, come here, and they might say here, or you might say, do you want to eat? And they might say eat or want eat. So sometimes they um, echo the end of the phrase. So it just depends. Some kids, as they're able to um, output more words, then they might, they might um, echo the entire phrase. So at first, when you have this immediate delay, I think a lot of times you notice it because you might have a flashcard and you might say, say dog, and what do they say, you guys? Tell me in the comments. It's gonna take a second for it to come through. But if I say, say dog, 
if they are have immediate echolalia, they're going to say what? They're going to say, say dog. And a lot of times they even imitate your intonation. Yes, Jill, you got it. So those kids can, yes. Oh, you guys are geniuses. See, you know way more about Gestalt language processing than you think you do. Okay. You guys have it. Like everyone has it exactly. Um, or someone says, you know, what's your name? And then you try to prompt them like, okay, say Elliot. And they might say, say Elliot, if they don't say, what's your name? Um, so those are a couple examples of immediate echolalia. Let me know in the comments. Do you have kids like this? Is it like your whole class, your whole caseload? Um, my morning class, I have all students who are autistic. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is the whole morning. Lots of echolalia. Now delayed echolalia, refers to utterances that are repeated with a significant delay. So this is for me what feels like a lot of times kids have heard it and learned it and then they kind of start bringing it back into play later. Or kids that have like that processing time. So maybe it was kind of uh, something they heard earlier in the day and then all of a sudden you hear them saying it later, like they're kind of practicing it or repeating it, but it's later in the day. But more often I notice delayed echolalia when it's something that has been said to the child a lot and they are using it to explain what's going on um, or calm themselves. So this is best uh, with an example. So I had a student once who the in the integrated preschool classroom, the teacher was saying, she seems sad, but she kept saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And what we found out then is that's what, I mean, I, that one was pretty easy to guess. That's what mom said to her when she was sad or upset. Are you okay? Oh, it's okay, baby. It's okay. And so when they're doing that, we're going to talk a little bit about pronoun reversals, but that's why those pronoun reversals happen, is they're saying it how it was said to them. So of course, they're not saying, I'm okay, or, or are, they say, are you okay? Not, I'm sad, I'm hurting. Um, the other one, and this was, I have like a little graphic for this, because it was so great. This happened a couple weeks ago in my classroom, and I have this student that loves songs, loves nursery rhymes. We can't chit chat and have a conversation uh, with her verbal speech, but she can say a lot of words, but she has a lot of the delayed echolalia. But the awesome thing is she's starting to use these chunks or gestalts in appropriate times. So for example, we were, I was sitting, going to work with her and she came over to me and she went to sit on the chair and she missed the chair and she fell on the ground. And it wasn't a far way to fall, but she, boom, she fell on the ground and she looked up at me and she said, we all fall down. Now, do you guys know what that's from? Think you, you're probably, if you don't know right away, you're going to be like, oh yeah, I know what that's from. But she said it just like the song. We all fall down. And so it was her way. Yeah, Megan, ring around the rosy. So it was her way of letting me know I fell down. But she didn't have that novel language to let me know. She didn't have that self-generated language to let me know, right? So she used this chunk. And does she know what we means? That it's more than one person? No. Does she know fall down? She probably kind of knows that, but she she didn't know how to just uh, come up with a novel sentence with that, right? That's what I'm trying to say. So she used that chunk to let me know. And I thought it was genius and amazing. So she said, we all fall down. And I said, oh, yeah, you fell down. Uh, so... Let me know in the comments, do you have any of those like pieces of songs or phrases that kids have heard somewhere else that you hear them say a lot that you could maybe think and go, oh, 
sometimes you go, I think that's from something. What is that from? And a lot of times if you ask the parents, they know exactly what it's from and what the meaning is. So ask parents because they're our best detectives with that. Once we figure out like kind of what it's from, we can work with it. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, so in the beginning with echolalia, the children learn chunks of language. And so that's where they're singing the entire songs or entire phrases. So they might come up to you and say, do you want to go outside? And they don't mean me, they mean that they want to go outside, but that is the sentence or the chunk of language that the adult usually uses with them. So they have memorized it and to them it basically means like, outside, get me outside, right? So they say that whole chunk. Um, people used to think that echolalia was meaningless and purposeless, uh, but over the years research shows that many times, a lot of times, it does have meaning. And it just might not be super apparent to us right from the start what the meaning is. And so that's where I'm saying we need to be detectives with people that know the child best to kind of figure out what do some of these gestalts, chunks of language, delayed echolalia, what do they mean? Uh, Amanda said, we have a little boy whose mom often says, get into your car seat, so when he wants to go home, he tells us, get into your car seat. Yes. Oh my gosh, Amanda, that is the best example. So someone that doesn't know him and isn't familiar with him and maybe doesn't know autism as well might be like, what is he talking about? There is no car seat here. We're not in a car. But you guys know what it means and you can build on it and use it. So that's fantastic. I love that example. Okay, so here is the little visual of we all fall down. So a Gestalt language processor, they learn the chunks versus the individual words. And here, um, I don't know if you can read it, it's kind of small, but the Gestalt language processor used the chunk of language from Ring Around the Rosie. And when he fell down, he says, we all fall down. And an analytic language processor uses self-generated, either single words or combining the two words or a short phrase, and he might say, fall down, or I fall down. Uh, so you can kind of see the difference there. Uh, Lindsay said, my son's way to greet people is to say, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, I wish that I could hear how he says that. Is it super animated or is it just a welcome to the show? I would love to hear that. Okay, so this is what I feel is so fun and exciting about my job and the kids that I work with. They learn differently, right? So there's not just one way of learning language. Uh, the way that all the tests are normed on and that we're used to is that analytic language processor, that way of learning language. But there's just more and more information coming out with the neurodiversity movement that supports children who are autistic a lot of times, most of the time, are Gestalt language processors. And so what we want to ask is like, how can we better support them instead of trying to get them to fit the mold of how typical children learn? Uh, how can we support them in the way that they learn best? And Lindsay said, same cadence as he hears it on TV. Welcome to the show. I love it. Maybe I'll say that every time I start my Facebook Lives. <laughs> okay, so what is a gestalt? So you're going to hear a lot of terms like he's a gestalt language processor or um, gestalt language processing or just gestalt. Like, oh, that's a gestalt. So that might be something we would have referred before to as, oh, I think that was delayed echolalia. Well, a gestalt is that, a chunk of language that the child has stored into their memory for later use. Welcome to the show, right? That is a chunk and it's stored in the memory for later use. And then when kids start using it at those times that are appropriate, like Lindsay's son, like greeting people, man, I just think that's fascinating and so smart and clever. So 
one person you're going to want to follow, it's uh, Alexandria, I don't know how to say her last name, Zakos or Zakos. She is an SLP uh, like me, but she worked, uh, was a mentee under Marge LeBlanc. And she did all this work many years ago um, in Gestalt language processing. And so Alexandria has a course out right now called the Meaningful Speech Course. And if you want to learn more about it, you can go to this website, MeaningfulSpeech.com, and read about it. But I've taken her course, and I love it. And if you want to dive in really deep and get lots of support with it, um, she is a great resource. So definitely check her out. Okay, so I'm going to give you some examples from my classroom with Gestalt Language Processing. And some of these have happened this week, and one of them was actually today. So these are super recent examples. So this picture of this little guy with the Legos and the, or the Duplos and the dog. He is a little guy that uh, he, he does not like going into the gym. We have a little gym and a big gym and it's maybe sensory or maybe like, I don't know what's going on with this place. I want to get to the room and play with all my favorite toys. So yesterday I thought, you know, we've honored when he says, we say gym class, uh, show him the picture, and then we can tell by his body language um, or kind of pushing it away, he does not want to go. So I've been honoring it and showing him the all done picture, and he says, all done, and then we just move on and do something else for him. Someone stays back with him. Well, yesterday I thought, well, we were playing with these Duplos the other day and he really liked them. Maybe we could just play with Duplos in the gym to just kind of get used to being in that room. Uh, so, and I wasn't going to push it if he didn't want to, but he followed me with those right into the gym. And we were playing with him on the floor and I started building a tower. And I can't remember exactly how it started. I may have started this because I knew he loved the song Hickory Dickory Dock. And you guys, let me know in the comments. Do you guys, are your kids all obsessed with the super simple songs, Hickory Dickory Dock, where the elephant's at the end and he like makes the, the clock smash into a bunch of pieces? Okay, so the anticipation with that song is the best and I you're gonna hear me talk about it a couple times tonight because uh, a lot of my students right now really love it so he's down there I build this tower and I say oh it's the clock hickory dickory duck and he grabbed the little uh, dog to that goes with the duplos and he said monkey and I said oh you want it to be the monkey that goes up the clock okay so I sang hickory dickory dock and all of a sudden we're in the gym where he doesn't normally like to be and he's got this big smile on his face and he knows what's coming. He knows we are going to do the whole hickory dickory dock thing. So this is where his gestalt with the chunks of that song, he loved it so much and is so familiar with it that he was able to even kind of pretend that the dog was a monkey. So he went hickory dickory duck. The monkey went up the clock. The clock struck one. Ding. Down he run. Hickory dickory duck. And then we got another uh, character and pretended it was the elephant. And then we made the tower fall down. So this is like a little example of how you can kind of use some of those gestalts, uh, some of those big chunks, those songs that you know that they love and expand on it. So we didn't literally have a clock, a grandfather clock, like he was allowing me to pretend with the Legos, the Duplos, and he even, he on his own was able to change the character, not all kids could do that, from the dog to the monkey. And he didn't sing along, but he could add in a word if I left it out. So hickory dickory duck, the, and he go, monkey, went up the clock. And we played that several times and we just had the best time. So that is one way you can kind of use and expand on some of their favorite things. Okay, another with Hickory Dickory Duck, because I told you this is the favorite right now. So I have this little girl, 
And she is just loves, loves, loves that song. So I had this cactus and we were putting the flowers in the cactus and kind of working on numbers and stuff. And I took the little mouse that we had. She grabbed for the bucket of animals, stuffed animals that I have and figurines. And so she grabbed this mouse and I took it and I said, hickory dickory dock, the... And one of our things we were working on was animals and animal sounds, like labeling them. Now, with her, if I would hold up a flashcard of a mouse and say, what is it? She, it's not motivating to her. It's not meaningful to her. Some kids are great with like labeling flashcards to kind of just build a base of uh, vocabulary, but she is not one. She could care less and probably with that direction that I'm giving, like, what is it? She either tunes it out or doesn't know what I want her to do. So I go with this cactus and we're, we're using a cactus instead of a clock. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse went up the cactus, the cactus poked him out. So then we're working on exclamatory words. The mouse ran down, hickory dickory dock, tick, Talk, but I'm using it all within one of her gestalts that she loves. Then she pulled out the next animal and gave it to me. So I'd say hickory dickory dock, the horse, she said horse, ran up the clock. So she was able to name all those animals and it was within this kind of relationship-based, play-based activity that she loved. So you guys, let me know in the comments, do you see this kind of thing working for any students in particular? Do any students pop into your mind where you could kind of use this kind of gestalt language processing to uh, teach skills even, like just to expand on their favorite songs? Okay, this one is not, this example is not a song, but this was a student that I had last year. And he would we would come to work and he would say we'd do an activity and then maybe we'd start a second one and whenever we figured out later whenever the activity was kind of hard for him he would say goodbye see you later goodbye see you later and at first it's kind of out of context like what's he talking about what is you know oh you know people might think well that's meaningless echo delayed echolalia meaningless well we figured out pretty quickly, he's saying, I want to be done with this. Like, it's either I don't like this activity, I don't understand it, but in any case, I want to be done with this activity. And so for us to be able to honor that as if he was saying no, and then we can use visuals to model like all done or something like that, honor it, I, as an educator, can adjust the activity for the next time so that it's not as hard for him uh, and causing him that stress response. So the goodbye, see you later, maybe came out without a lot of emotion the first time, but as he said it, each time he said it over and over, you could hear the stress in his voice. So it was definitely, uh, hey, this is too much. I can't do this. And I think that we need to honor that more in the classroom and throw away the idea of like, oh, he's just getting away with not doing it. Like we need to throw that out the window and go, how can I make this make better sense to him or be more engaging to him? And oftentimes that is maybe decreasing the difficulty or using some special interests to uh, make it more motivating to him, right? Okay, so this one was just today and you guys are gonna love it, okay? So this little girl, she was the one that liked the hickory dickory dock and the cactus. And I'm taking no credit for this one because I have a para who did a phenomenal job. This is one of those things that's really hard to teach, like as an educator or an SLP, to teach other people to kind of intuitively do. But this para did it, and I was all over her like, this is amazing, let me take a video of this so I can show other 
other people. So I can't show the video on here, but I'm showing my other Paris, so they kind of get an idea. But this little girl loves mommy finger, mommy finger, where are you? Here I am, here I am, how do you do? Excuse my singing, my musician husband does not think I'm a good singer and cringes, so it's all good, right? Opposites attract. So anyway, she loves mommy finger, mommy finger, that whole song, and she'll sing it over and over. So the para sang that with her several times and then pulled out these animals and she put one on each finger and said, duck finger, duck finger, where are you? Here I am, here I am, how do you do? After they did it once, this little girl wanted to do it over and over. Again, this is the one, the little girl, if you held up any of these and said, what is it? She probably is not going to answer. But does she know what each of these animals are? Yes, because she was labeling them during her song, which was a gestalt. It was her favorite song, but she was starting, she's starting to be able to change or mitigate some of the words in it. So swapping out those words, that's that next step for kids that are open to it and ready. So she went over and over, you know, horse finger, horse finger, where are you? Here I am, here I am, how do you do? She was having the best time and I was so proud of my para. She did such a good job with it. Okay, this one's a little bit of a personal story. So the picture of the two boys on Halloween are my son, Nate, and he's in the camel shirt, and my first kindergarten student ever when I started working with autistic children in 1999. So they have been trick-or-treating together, you know, all through elementary. They are now uh, Willie, the little Buzz Lightyear there, my first kindergartner. He's 29 years old now. And he still comes trick-or-treating at my house. So that is him in the shark costume from last night. He came, he was the first trick-or-treater to come to my new house that I moved into last month. So Willie, though, whenever he sees Nate, uh, my son, and whenever he hears his name, he says, what will happen if Nate puts the weights in the pool? And he'll say this to people that don't really know him or know Nate or know what that's about. But if someone was to do some detective work and ask me, like, what does that mean? I know exactly what it means. And it's his way of starting conversation. So he doesn't say like, hey, how's Nate doing? Right? That self-generated speech is still hard. But if he says, what will happen if Nate puts the weights in the pool? It's a way that he gets conversation going with me. And sometimes it's how he, I think, is asking about Nate, his childhood friend. And so, do you guys want to know what it means? Let me know in the comments. <laughs> okay, so when they were little, Willie has an indoor pool in his house. And so I would bring Nate over and they would swim together. And they used to drop weights in the pool, like little dumbbells. They'd drop the weights in the pool and then they'd dive down and get them. They both could swim underwater really well. So they would dive down and get them and bring them up. Well, one time the liner of the pool ripped and it's an in-ground pool. The liner ripped and they had to get the liner replaced. So after that, the rule was no more weights in the pool. You can't put weights in the pool. And I think a lot of these uh, gestalts or like chunks or phrases that kids remember for a very long time are often emotionally charged, right? So for that, that was a big deal to in Willie's life because he had to like not go in the pool for a while because they had to redo the whole liner. So it was a big deal like, Willie, no more weights in the pool. So they got the new liner, filled it back up. At some point, we came back over, had no clue. We had no clue about the, the liner ripping or any of that. For some reason, the weights were still in that pool area. So what did my son do? He went and put the weights in the, the pool right away and 
to Willie, like, it was probably shocking because Nate just broke the rule. Well, Nate didn't know the rule, but Willie's like, what will happen if Nate puts the weights in the pool? And the answer is, it will rip the liner. So that's his connection to Nate. And I think because it was so emotionally charged for him, that's what he's always going to remember, his association with Nate after all those years of playing together. That's the big thing that stands out to him. And it's how we get, he gets conversation going. So pretty cute, huh? Okay. So we're getting towards the end here, but who are Gestalt language processors? So most autistic children are Gestalt language processors. And while all kids at some point repeat others uh, when they're developing language, they quickly move on to using single words to communicate and more of that self-generated speech. So here are the three signs that I promised you, but it was kind of a lot of precursor to get to this. Echolalia, like we've talked about. A young child who is immediately echolaling, echoing and has echolalia, um, what is said to them, or at least the last part of what's said to them, is most likely a Gestalt language processor. So that's one of your signs. Sign number two. You can probably guess this after everything I talked about tonight, too. All toddlers and preschoolers sing songs. Uh, however, if you have a student who's not using verbal speech to communicate what they want with you, to chit chat, to let you know what they don't want, but they can sing entire songs or engage in scripting, you can hear them. Sometimes it's jargon at first where you're like, I don't understand what they're saying, but it sounds like speech. Like they might not be able to articulate because they're young, all of the sounds uh, or the words that they're wanting to say. But a lot of times the jargon that sounds like speech is from something. We just can't understand it yet. So if you have kids scripting, even if it's jargon, uh, they're probably a Gestalt language processor. And number three, the third sign that you have a Gestalt language processor on your hands is are those pronoun reversals. And so this happens when they use that delayed echolalia and a parent might say, you're okay, honey, you're okay. And then when the child's at school and they're sad, they might say, you're okay, honey, or you're okay, baby. And the people around them might be saying like, who are they talking to? Like, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. And they're using the pronoun they heard when this was said to them. And so in this case, they're probably trying to self-soothe. And uh, if that's the case, co-regulation is gonna help. Like you take their cue and soothe them like they're kind of asking you to. Um, But they're not talking about another person around them when they're saying you, they're talking about themselves. Okay, so some other places you can learn more. Barry Prezant, have you guys heard his name? Yes or no? And have you read or listened to his book, Uniquely Human? I'm in the middle of the audio book because I like listening on the way to and from work. He has so much good information, not just about Gestalt language processing, but anything and everything when it comes to autism, the neurodiversity movement, um, being really relationship focused and child led. Like he has done years and years of research and his stuff is amazing. So check out his book or audio book. I will link it in the comments after we're done here. Um, I talked to you about Alexandria's Meaningful Speech course. That's another good one. And then there is a book by Marge LeBlanc, which is where Alexandria got a lot of her uh, education on this topic. It's called Natural Language Acquisition and Gestalt Language. So I'll be sure to put the uh, link to that in the comments too. Lindsay said she started the book Uniquely Human and she likes the podcast. So there is a podcast too by, uh, I'll try to find that and link it for you too. So these are all great uh, people to learn from. And you can also learn more by following these two people on Instagram, uh, play underscore spark. She is an SLP and she has such great stuff about Gestalt language processing on Instagram and TikTok. So check her out. Take a screenshot if you need to and follow Meaningful Speech on Instagram. So she's got a lot of stuff too. Okay, now before I tell you what we're going to talk about next week, 
Let me know in the comments. Was this helpful? Did it clear it up a little bit for you to kind of help muddle through this uh, terminology, the Gestalt language processing? Um, I do have a blog post that goes along with this. I'll link that in the comments too. But uh, I hope I gave you a little place to start. Um, and when I talked about the echolalia and delayed echolalia, you probably realize like you know more than you do. It's just a different name for it. And uh, one of the things that was kind of newer for me over the last couple of years is the idea of kids learning language in different ways and it's okay. So you can be an analytic language processor or a gestalt language processor. Okay, you guys, I'm so glad that I'm hearing it's helpful. Reach out if you have any questions. Um, Monica said, I missed the first part. Can we watch and listen on replay? Yes. So it's going to be on YouTube and on Facebook. Sometimes it's easier to find on YouTube. Um, and it's just Autism Little Learners on YouTube. And I am going to start, if this worked, broadcasting these lives to Facebook and YouTube at the same time. And then it's just there on YouTube for the replay. So go to YouTube uh, to Autism Little Learners and hit the subscribe so that you get any updates if there's like a new training that pops up that you missed on Facebook. Um, Stacy, I don't have these explanations in written form, but maybe I can come up with like a one pager uh, to help out with that. I will write that down and think about it tonight. See how I can support you with that. Okay, next week I will be talking about five ways that you can increase joint attention in your autistic child or students. So we know forcing or making goals about eye contact is out, but we still want our kids to reference us and uh, have shared enjoyment and joint attention with us. So how are we going to do that? Let me know. Are you interested in this topic? Is this something that would be helpful to take away five kind of actionable things you can put into practice at home or in your classroom? Um, and I am going to be working on that this week and have it ready for you next week. All right. Oh, good, Elizabeth. I'm glad. Okay, you guys, in the comments, I'm going to go and put those links in shortly and then... Man, I talked for a long time today. It was supposed to be a half hour, and here we are at almost 45 minutes. So this is a big topic. Um, let me know in the comments, too. Would you like more on this topic in particular? Okay, I'm going to go. Have a great week, and I will see you same time, same place next week on Tuesday.